Help us now, Father, to listen to your word to us. Speak to our hearts through it, we pray, by your spirit. And help us to learn the lessons you intend for us according to your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. So in our journey through the book of Revelation, we've now reached chapter 5. Let's just recap the scene. John is writing what he sees as he is spoken to by Jesus Christ and transported in the Spirit to the throne room of heaven where he sees the glory of God in all its symbolism. Uh, at a point in time, we're led to understand close to the final judgment of the earth. He sees the throne and God seated on it. We've seen in the last chapter how everything centers on that throne, or rather the one sitting on it. Then, by degrees, John is seeing more detail. Uh, the throne is surrounded by these four special angelic creatures with eyes all over, and then 24 elders representing saved humanity, and all are engaged continuously in worship and praise, acknowledging God's holiness, his eternity, his creation of all things, all life, all matter, all energy, such is the honor, the homage that he requires and deserves. But the vision continues. Uh, what we're about to see is uh, now, firstly, the unopened scroll, verse 1 to 3, and second, the worthy lion, verse 4 to 5, and thirdly, the enthroned lamb, uh, verse 6 to 7. So firstly, the, the unopened scroll, verse 1 to 3 of chapter 5, then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. So John is still looking at the throne and he then notices something else. Verse 1, perhaps his eyes or whatever with which he saw the vision were getting more accustomed to the brightness of glory and he was able to see more detail about the figure seated on the throne. Something is happening there. It's a significant moment. What's going on? Something you don't see every day. In his right hand there now appeared a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. The seals might have protruded from the edge at various places as divisions in the actual content of what was written. And to open the first seal would only let you read as far as the second. Further permission was needed to progress and so on. The scroll itself is symbolic like the rest of this vision, though the things behind it are as real as can be. Its copious writings are visible to John but not readable. They are so complete that nothing can be added and they are protected by these seven seals in succession. And we'll find as we read on that the seven seals correspond with the seven trumpets of chapters 8 to 9 sounding the judgments of God upon the earth and uh, the seven bowls of his wrath in chapter 16. Uh, some take the view that these happen after each other, uh, but I think I prefer the view that they are concurrent. Uh, the same judgment looked at uh, in three aspects, with of course more besides. Anyway, clearly this book was sealed up until the right time, when someone uh, with the right authority would be able to break those seals, one by one, unleashing those promised judgments onto the earth, all the way to the very end, all of which have been predetermined in advance. And John is not able to give away any of the writing, the content, it's all the secret of God, to be revealed only at the final day. We only get to see uh, the effects of them being opened and executed, and then perhaps only a selection uh, of what is to come. And then uh, John sees a mighty angel, verse 2, who proclaims in a loud voice a mighty 
proclamation. But the proclamation is a question. Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? This mighty angel must have a loud enough voice to reach everyone in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth. This is a broadcast to all creation. Who is worthy? It seems that the time has now come, and all that is needed is the right agent with the right credentials. Let him come forth and break these seals and open the scroll. And so uh, the ripeness of the time is what is being proclaimed. And, and the one who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll is being sought out by those who long for justice on the earth and righteousness to prevail, wrongs to be reversed, sin and evil to be dealt with. This worthiness is a, is a practical power to do this thing as well as the moral right to do so. Who then is worthy? Well, it's tempting to think that at this point John is somehow being toyed with. Uh, verse 3, his emotions being milked. Nobody immediately responded. In fact, uh, the answer to this great question was already known. Nothing in all creation is worthy to determine its future outcome because creation itself is created. Whatever you create, if you had the know-how to, to build a robot or even engineer an animal, it would never surpass you, the designer. You could never make something as powerful as yourself. And so it is with creation. Its very createdness renders it unworthy of implementing God's master plan. It cannot be the executor of his will. Uh, Genesis 2:20, uh, and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. Of course, we know better than John did at that moment. We know what's coming next. There is none but Christ who can execute the will of God. But John was made to feel the full horror of what if. What if? What if no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside? What would be the implications if that were the case? Only the one without sin can cast stones of judgment. And not only would there be no justice possible, but no salvation. It would not be possible to wind up this world or renew it. It must go on in its hateful, filthy, unjust, corrupt wicked way, indefinitely, forever. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 19, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is in vain. And we are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Have you ever allowed yourself to consider what if? It's scary. 1 Corinthians 15.32 If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for human motives, what did I gain? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. It certainly makes you appreciate when you come round how good it is to have a saviour and to know him. What a relief and what a joy to know that there is an end to Satan's stranglehold on the world, that there is a victor who is all good and all loving. This is the Christian's hope. Don't ever take it for granted. Don't ever despise it because what else have you got? Well, secondly, the worthy lion, verse 4 to 5. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals.
And so John really has to suffer this darkness that comes before the dawn. Verse 4, he began to openly weep simply at this fact of no one being worthy to open the scroll and look inside. Was it just that he was to be denied what seemed to be promised in chapter 4, verse 1? Uh, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Is he not to be shown? Is he behaving like a toddler, having a tantrum? No, it's not just his frustration at what could not be practically done. I see that the food bank's latest wish list includes can openers. What's the use of stockpiling all that canned food if you haven't got a can opener? I suppose that'll be the next thing disappearing from the shelves. You've got to have something capable of doing the job. But it's not just that. John saw at that moment the logical conclusion of there not being a savior. If that book is not opened, the prophecies cannot be fulfilled. The world cannot be delivered from sin. In short, there can be no hope for anyone. And this horror, this hopelessness, is something that every sinner needs to feel in a slightly different way before they can uh, really desire salvation. They need to see just how offensive their sins are to a holy God, how wretched they are without Christ, how deserving they are of hell, how perilous their situation, and how frightful their future outlook really is. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I can't understand how many Christians, and we meet them at the open airs, object to the use of this fear when it comes to evangelism and soul winning. No, God doesn't want us to fear him. He's only love. Well, they call themselves Christians, but they can't have read the Bible, except very selectively. Godly sorrow yes, with weeping, is utterly appropriate for the convicted sinner. He sees plain as can be what the liberal denies, that if left to himself, he must be hell-bound. And that is precisely the condition that makes Jesus so desirable when he comes into view in all his mercy, his forgiveness, his sacrifice, his defeat of death, his absolute power and willingness to save. Oh, what a relief! when his daylight dawned on our blackness of soul. Tears of sorrow turned to tears of joy. If ever there was a purpose to misery and despair, this is it. And meanwhile, those who never saw the obnoxiousness of their sins, likewise never valued the one who was able to take them away. And in their ignorance, they perish. They already have their comforts in their denial of any need for regeneration cold comfort that will prove as the consequences unfold. So, not wishing to leave John in this distressed state, one of the elders then had to console and correct him. Verse 5, I wonder if this elder is in fact the apostle's own future self. He's told not to weep because someone has, after all, triumphed. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And the elder describes this person as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. These are both uh, titles for the Lord Jesus Christ and they show him in both his divinity and humanity. And the elders have already hinted at his worthiness. In 4 verse 11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and power and honor, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Although no created being is worthy of these things, there is yet one uncreated who is. In fact, it's an imperative that John stops weeping. It's entirely inappropriate. He's directed to look. He's told to see this conquering lion and root. Now, uh, the lion of Judah is taken from Genesis 49, 9 to 10. Uh, Judah is a young lion. My son, you return from the prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? 
the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes and the allegiance of the nations is his. Jesus was born a man, a Jew of the tribe of Judah, a descendant of Jacob and of David the king. Hebrews 7.14, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. David was a man after God's own heart, but after his death, Israel went into decline. The glory of Solomon faded, and the lion appeared to be extinguished. But the prophets foretold a shoot or branch coming out of his line, one who would be the invincible king of kings and inherit David's throne forever. We read Isaiah 11, 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Jesus Christ is that eternal king, even in his human nature, because he has triumphed over death. Luke 1, 32 to 33, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The lion is the symbol of victory. He was crucified, died, and was buried, and on the third day rose to life, and now he reigns from the throne of God. And all who trust in him, turning from sins against God, can share in that risen life. But at the same time, he is also the root of David. Not only the shoot, but the root. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify to all of you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. He is great David's greater son. He surpasses David because he was before him. Matthew 22, 41 to 45. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And the point of that lesson, of course, is that Jesus Christ is God, as well as man. He inherits the throne of David, but he is already the eternal king, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. We need a saviour who is both God and man. He must be man in order to pay the price of death that we owe for our sin, but he must be God to be sinless, to defeat death and rise again. And because he is both these things, he has achieved this victory where no one else ever could. And we too can overcome death itself and be raised to life with him in heaven for eternity. Those elders are already there. And thanks to Jesus, who conquered by the cross, we can join them hereafter. And thanks to Jesus also, that scroll and its seven seals can be opened. The universe can be redeemed. The earth and the rest of creation can be restored. His suffering people can be defended and avenged. The world can be judged. The kingdom can be consummated. And if these things can be done, they will be done because morally they must be done. God is holy and his judgments are all righteous. The shoot of David this seed of Abraham and of the woman has finally crushed the serpent's head. The battles and the judgments may commence. The conclusion of the war is now certain. The Lord must trample on all his foes, and thanks be to him for it. But thirdly now, the enthroned lamb, verse 6 and 7. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne.
So now, John, who is now so elated with this new thought that yes, there is a judge, yes, there is a savior of the world, he turns to look at what is now visible, perhaps expecting to see a majestic lion in some kind of battle dress with all the pips of rank and all the medals of victory, maybe even with David riding on his back. But what does he see? A lamb, capital L. John 1, 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How can a lion be as meek as a lamb or a lamb as brave as a lion? Answer, by being both. And it's not especially a healthy looking lamb, but maybe it is healthy. Doesn't look like a lamb without spot or blemish, but maybe it is. The lamb looked as if it had been slain, as if the sacrifice had gone ahead, and there it was lying, no, not lying, standing. Jesus is the one who has always lived, yet was dead, and yet is alive again, having risen from the dead. He has conquered by means of his humiliation. He still bears the marks of his crucifixion and yet is now, in his dual nature, healthier and more glorious than he ever appeared on earth. And where was he standing? In the center of the throne, the place of absolute power, rule, and dominion. Uh, occupants of a throne uh, normally sit to rule, but when they stand, it means they're ready for action. Some great enterprise is afoot. And he's seated there with his father, just as he said, in 3 verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And he's made uh, the center co-equal and co-eternal with the father, rewarded even in his human nature for his great trouble, even to death. And there they sit as one, waited on by those four living creatures, gazed on in adoration by these 24 elders, the subject of endless worship, reigning jointly as king, singular king of the universe, as he sets about to fully implement the victory he had won at the cross. And that is what this imagery is teaching. That is what John is keen to communicate, that he saw that throne and the father and son united on it. And look again. That's not all. The lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. And John interprets these by the inspiration of God as the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. In other words, the Holy Spirit in all his sevenfold perfection. Horns are symbolic of strength and power, in particular as Christ's power works upon the earth. Uh, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And also seven eyes, representing perfect omniscience, wisdom, and understanding. Fewer eyes than the living creatures have, but better, far better. Uncreated, they amount to the sevenfold spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is also the spirit of Christ. Romans 8, 9, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And by this spirit, he goes out into all the earth. Those torches we see in 4 verse 5 are to be born to the ends of the earth. Uh, John 16, 8, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The whole Trinity then is here together on the throne of God. They are not three separate beings, and neither are they one without distinction, but we as Christians believe in one God who subsists in three persons, and those persons reign together as one God with one will. Perfect unity, perfect harmony, perfect relationship, the model to which the church should aspire and strive to emulate. Let me just read to you now the, the Nicene Creed, which is the, the church's a definitive statement on this subject. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is 
seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. and We look for the resurrection of the dead and of the life of the world to come. Amen. I should explain that a Catholic with a small c refers to the worldwide unity of all true believers. And apostolic means, not that we have apostles now, but that we stick to the teaching of the original apostles. Anyway, we believe not only in his identity as a Trinitarian triune God, but in his authority and power to rule and to judge. And we know that the Father has committed all judgment to the Son. The members of the Trinity have distinct roles in the implementation of justice and also mercy and salvation. It is the Father who decreed from the beginning uh, that some should be saved and chose them as a gift to his Son. And it is the Son who became voluntarily subordinate to the Father to wreak out our salvation in his humble, sinless life and death on the cross. And it is the Holy Spirit who applies that salvation to those for whom it was always intended when he, he leads them to faith in the Son when they were still at enmity with God and, and he transforms their lives by the truth as the Spirit of Christ who, who enters into them. And it is the Son, the Lamb, who came and took the scroll, verse 7, from the hand of him who sat on the throne, the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That little transaction, just the passing of a piece of paper between two people on the same seat, is hardly discernible, but it will have enormous implications. In that scroll are the fate or destiny of nations, kings, individuals, the whole human race and the rest of creation. The judgments it contains must all come to pass because the Lamb has got the scroll and he is the one who is able to open that scroll and its seven seals. And so the great transaction is done. The scroll is now in the Lamb's possession and he will carry out the whole will of God that is inscribed upon it. There are many today who say that those judgments have already started. Look at all the wars, they say, the earthquakes, the deadly plagues, even the locusts. Well, I wonder. They may just be the beginning of labor pains for the world. The Puritans wrote some wonderful things on the Bible on justification by faith, they were second to none. On the Gospels, glorious. The Old Testament, excellent. On most of Scripture, Paul's letters, wonderful. But when it came to Revelation, it's rather embarrassing to read what they wrote on it. Reams and reams of historical references, supposedly fulfillments of these various judgments, now long forgotten conquests of the Dark Ages, and of course the papacy, they might have been right about that one. But it leads me to suspect that those who write similar 
things today about this age and current villains may have cause to eat their words uh, in a few years. Don't let's cry wolf until we really see the wolf. Let's not get immersed in the details. Let's keep the big picture in the forefront. God is on the throne in his threefold majesty. His judgments will be absolute in power and in righteousness. And we need to be on the right side of him, the sheep, not the goats. And don't forget, the judge is also the savior. He presents as a benign little lamb, cruelly killed. He sides with those who've come to the end of themselves, fled from sin and taken refuge in him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you done that yet? Can't you see the need to do that yet? The amnesty still stands. We don't know for how much longer, but he calls you today. Come to him, give your life to him, and trust him for your eternal future. Shall we pray? Dear Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ came to save sinners. We thank you that he defeated the devil like a lion by offering you the pleasing life that we could not and then dying for our sins like a lamb. Help us now to repent and put our trust in him and in him alone. Help us to banish all worthless idols from our hearts. Help us to see our utter dependence on what he has done for us and your sustaining of us daily. We may not enjoy your judgments on the earth, but we know that they are right and good and must surely be. Conform us more closely to your will, we pray, that we may enjoy your presence more to the full and finally take our place in worship before that throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.